The scripture for today's message is from John 14, verse 23. Jesus said, if people love me, they will obey my teachings. My Father will love them, and we will come to them and make our home with them. Last week, we began a series inspired by the popular TV show Fixer Upper that features Chip and Joanna Gaines. The Gaineses make no secret that they are Christians, and I believe they would be pleased to hear that we are looking at our spiritual journey through the lens of their renovation show. In the opening, we said, Chip and Joanna give their clients a choice. Do you have the guts to take on a fixer-upper? Last time, I pointed out that our spiritual journey begins with God choosing us to be his fixer-upper, and we accept his offer when we, by faith, trust in him and are saved by his grace. He has chosen us, but we must accept his offer and choose him. After the client makes their choice, the next step in the Fixer Upper show is to sit down around the table with Joanna Gaines and let her show you her new design plan for your home. She uses a computer model to show you what changes will be made in the layout and decor. Almost always it involves walls being removed or moved to open up the space, new cabinets, flooring, and lighting fixtures inside. Carpet has to go, hardwood floors or tile will be put down, plus lots of shiplap and subway tile. The outside changes may involve moving windows or doors, landscaping, new paint, and structural changes. What you don't see in the TV show is the time that Joanna or her staff have spent interviewing the family to find out what their style and priorities are. It's clear from watching the show that she has gotten to know the client's taste and needs before they sit down to view the design plan. She has tailored her design with them clearly in mind. I don't recall anyone ever saying, no, I don't want that. That won't do at all. After we accept Christ as our Savior, God intends to make us his home. Jesus says as much in John chapter 14, 23, if people love me, they will obey my teaching. My Father will love them, and we will come to them and make our home with them. Like Joanna Gaines, God has a new plan for our lives, a plan to transform us into the people he created us to be. And that plan, I'm sure, takes into consideration our unique gifts and personality, just as Joanna's designs for her fixer-upper homes do. Sometimes people fear that God's plan will ask them to do something they don't want to do, like go to be a missionary in a far-off strange land. I believe that God created us with gifts and passions and wants us to use them for the good of others and for the fulfillment that we get in using them. His plan doesn't generally include sending us to places where our gifts or passions are not suited. In other words, he won't send you to be a missionary unless he knows that you would not be happy doing anything else. When Vicki and I were first married, her grandfather, who was a Presbyterian pastor in Denver, Colorado, told me not to be a pastor unless I felt like I had to. At first, that seemed strange to me, but later I came to understand that he meant it shouldn't be something I do unless I wouldn't be happy doing something else or anything else. God's plan is not something that you should be afraid of, is what I want you to know today. God will make you the way you are, or God has made you the way you are, so that you can do the things for him that will not only please him, but also be rewarding to you. Other people think that God's plan for us is rigid and specific. They think that there's only one person that they could be happy being married to or only one job or one house uh, to choose or a town to live in, that God has a plan that, that, that is that specific for us. And one of the most popular scriptures that people use who believe in this kind of specific plan for their lives is Jer- Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 11. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. It's a beautiful verse, but there are several mistakes that we make when we read this verse. Number one, some of us put too much focus on the word prosper. Those who promote the so-called prosperity gospel interpret that God's going to prosper us, and that means material wealth or physical health. A second problem we have is that we believe it to be specific plans for our individual lives, such as the ones I've just mentioned, who we are to marry, where we live, what job we work, etc. And number three, we misunderstand that this purpose, this promise rather, was to all of God's people collectively, not individually. Our American nature is such that we emphasize rugged individualism, even in our faith. 
But God's promises and call in this passage were to his church collectively as a group. It pertains to what we do as a people, as his people. Listening to this popular scripture in its context and seeing the different feeling you get to take away from it will help you understand it better, I think. It was a promise given to the people who were in captivity in Babylon, a captivity, by the way, brought about by the collective waywardness of God's people. Some so-called prophets were predicting that they would return to their homes soon, but not the prophet Jeremiah. Beginning in Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 4, he says, This is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says to all those I carried into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. Build houses and settle down. Plant gardens and eat what they produce. Marry and have sons and daughters. Find wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage so that they too may have sons and daughters. Increase in number there. Do not decrease. Also, seek the peace and prosperity of the city to which I have carried you into exile. Pray to the Lord for it, because if it prospers, you too will prosper. When 70 years are completed for Babylon, I will come to you and fulfill my good promise to bring you back to this place. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. Notice it would take 70 years for this promise to come true. Some who heard it would never see it in their lifetime. It was a promise to the group, not the individual. God's plan for the individual was to settle down, fall in love, have a family, and pray for the peace and prosperity of the city in which you live right now. And really, what's more important than those things? Rick Warren, in his book, The Purpose Driven Life, points out that it's relationships that really matter. He says, I've been at the bedside of many people in their final moments when they stand on the edge of eternity. I've never heard someone say, bring me my diplomas. I want to look at them one more time. Show me my awards, my medals, that gold watch I got from work. When life on earth is ending, people don't surround themselves with objects. What we want around us is people, people that we love and have relationships with. And in our final moments, we all realize that relationships are what life is all about. Wisdom is learning that truth sooner rather than later, he says. I think I'm safe in saying that our relationship with God is included on that list of what life is all about. Recently, I went through some boxes of memorabilia that I had saved since high school. Things that once seemed so important to me seem so lame to me now. I count it all as rubbish compared to knowing and being known by God. The point I'm trying to make is that God's plan for us is not as mystical and certainly not as specific as we try to make it. He wants to, to live in us, and he wants to love through us, whatever we're doing, whoever we're with, wherever we are. Max Lucado in his book, The Great House of God, says, God wants to be your dwelling place. He has no intention of being a weekend getaway or a Sunday bungalow or a summer cottage. Don't consider using God as a vacation cabin or an eventual retirement home. He wants you under his roof now and always. He wants to be your mailing address, your point of reference. He wants to be your home. He wants to be the one in whom we live and move and have our being. The fact is, however, if God is going to live in us, there will be some remodeling done in our lives. We are his fixer-upper, and he wants to make us a home to be proud of. In short, God wants us to be like Jesus. Last week, I described my grandfather's house at the time we began to remodel it in 1979. I said that I loved that house, and that's why we chose to fix it up. But we did move in it as it was, with the sagging foundation and the raccoon in the upstairs bedroom. We loved it enough to make it better. As Max Locato says, God loves you just the way you are, but he loves you too much to leave you that way. He wants you to be just like Jesus. Paul writes in 2 Corinthians 3.18 that we all are being transformed into his image with ever-increasing glory, which comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. And in Ephesians 4, chapter, chapter 4, verse 22, verse uh, 23, Paul says, You were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires, to be made new in the attitude of your minds, to put on a new self, created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. There is some remodeling going on in each Christian life. 
in, classic, in the classic work, Mere Christianity, C.S. Lewis says, a po- he cites actually a parable from George MacDonald. And he says, I imagine, he says, yourself as a living house. God comes in to rebuild that house. At first, perhaps you can understand what he's doing. He's getting the drains right and stopping the leak in the roof and so on. And you knew those jobs needed doing, and so you're not surprised. But presently, he starts knocking the house about in a way that hurts abominably and does not seem to make sense. What on earth is he up to? The explanation is that he's building quite a different house from the one you thought of. Throwing out a new wing here, putting up an extra floor there, running up towers, making courtyards. You thought you were going to be made into a decent little cottage, but he's building a palace. He intends to come and live in it himself. Max Lucado must have been inspired by this in his book, Just Like Jesus. He says, God loves to decorate. God has to decorate. Let him live long enough in a heart, and that heart will begin to change. Portraits of hurt will be replaced by landscapes of grace. Walls of anger will be demolished and shaky foundations restored. God can do no more, or God can no more leave a life unchanged than a mother can leave her child's tear untouched. This might explain some of the discomfort in your life. Remodeling of the heart is not always pleasant. We don't object when the carpenter adds a few shelves, but he's been known to gut the entire West Wing. He has such high aspirations for you. God envisions a complete restoration, and he won't stop until he's finished. He wants you to be just like Jesus. That's the new design plan that God brings into every life that receives him to be like Jesus more and more until that day in heaven when we're made perfect in him. The name Christian literally means little Christ. So imagine God invites you to sit down at his table like Joanna Gaines does with her clients. He shows us a picture of what he has in mind for us. He shows us the life and teachings of Jesus, his only begotten son. And he says, this is what I'm talking about. This is what I have in mind for you. In Christ, God revealed a new design plan for all of us to follow. And so we should do what Jesus said. Follow. Follow me, he said. He is our plan. He is our, he is our destination. May we follow him. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, help us to be more like you. Help us, Lord, to remember the plan and not to get off on our own construction projects that take us away from what you have planned for us. To not uh, forget to look at the instructions and to go our own way and make mistakes and, 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 uh, and mar the building that you are, are making in us. Help us, Lord, to keep our eyes fixed on you, the author and perfecter of our faith. Make us like Jesus, we pray, Lord, in his name. Amen. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May may he make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. And may the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace now and forever. Amen.